Telltale Games are back, in case you hadn't heard. The company closed its doors in 2018, but now they have returned and are ready to go again. The closure of the studio had left hundreds of developers out of a job, and several franchises were stopped dead in their tracks. The company had reinvented the video game genre and created some of the industry's most impactful moments. Its death resonated throughout the gaming world. But now they're back, and they're not messing around. The Wolf Among Us is returning for a second season, plus a brand new game based on the sci-fi TV series The Expanse. But a lot of questions remain unanswered when it comes to Telltale Games. What exactly happened that led to the studio suddenly closing, despite its apparent success? Who's to blame for the mess the studio ended up in? Why have they been brought back? And most significantly of all, can they avoid making the same mistakes all over again? This is the story of the rise, fall, and return of a beloved studio, and the lessons that should be learned from it. Telltale emerged from the shadow of adventure game aficionados LucasArts in the early 2000s. Adventure games had waned in popularity during this period as the market shifted towards more action-focused games. Some of the LucasArts team, however, felt there was still an audience for these types of games. And so in 2004, Kevin Bruner, Dan Connors and Troy Melanda decided to go off and form their own studio to keep the genre alive. That studio was Telltale Games. Their plan was to carry on the legacy of popular franchises like Sam and Max and Monkey Island, as well as creating new series based on other IP, such as the CSI TV series. After some small success, they began to work on bigger IPs, signing deals to create adventure games based on Jurassic Park and Back to the Future. But it was another game released in 2012 that would change everything. The Walking Dead Season 1 shifted the landscape of Telltale and the genre forever. While still an episodic adventure title, the zombie game based on the comic books of the same name shifted design philosophy from puzzles to narrative, focusing on the emotional roller coaster of its main characters and the people they run into throughout their journey. You play as Lee Everett, a convicted felon who finds a young girl named Clementine alone in her home. Her parents have turned into zombies, sorry, walkers, and together you search for safety before coming to a climax that is as powerful and as devastating as video game narratives have ever produced. It was a genuinely staggering piece of work, as nail-biting as its TV series counterpart, and as gritty and hard-hitting as the comics that inspired it. The game was a huge success, selling a million copies in just 20 days, and earning an estimated $40 million in revenue during its first few years. Even more significantly, The Walking Dead set the template for all future adventure games, Titles like the excellent Firewatch, from a studio formed by former Telltale devs, lent heavily on the ideas present in The Walking Dead, and met with similar success. As for Telltale, well they began hoovering up intellectual properties left, right and centre, developing games in the worlds of Game of Thrones, Batman, Guardians of the Galaxy, even Minecraft. It seemed as if the company was flying, releasing several big titles every year to continued critical success. However, Behind the scenes, things were playing out very differently, and The Walking Dead was the poison chalice. With the enormous success of the game, investors and higher-ups at Telltale sought similar success with any and all future titles. And, according to former employees, there was one person in particular who took the wrong messages from The Walking Dead's success. Kevin Bruner became far more difficult to work with following this lucrative breakthrough. Often bullish and short-tempered, his ego began to take over the operation, and his belief in doing things his way became harder and harder to avoid. Many felt that he saw himself as a design auteur in the mold of industry titans like Hideo Kojima and Tim Schafer. He would often denigrate the role of other design leads on various projects, making himself the center of attention during press interviews and internal meetings. His behavior led to other design leads who worked on The Walking Dead, Sean Vanneman and Jake Rodkin, leaving Telltale. Such was the tension between the trio. Oh, by the way, they were the ones who created Firewatch. Funny how things work out, eh? Bruner's need to be the lead on every design decision also meant projects hit a bottleneck, as he micromanaged every aspect of the games Telltale was producing going so far as to rewriting tutorial text, a job usually trusted to lower level designers. In 2015, Bruner would go on to become CEO of Telltale, which is where things reached an idea. It got so bad that he became colloquially known as the company's Eye of Sauron, 
such was the fear his all-seeing approach to management became. So the question of who's to blame for Telltale's demise seems clear, doesn't it? Well, as much as I'd like for there to be a simple antagonist to blame for all that went wrong, the reality was a lot more complicated. There's a reason why most video game developers only work on one or two games at the same time. In order to maintain a certain level of quality, projects need care and attention. Developers need time to focus on creativity and innovation and ensure everything is up to scratch. But Telltale saw things differently. They could just keep using the same principles and mechanics that had worked for The Walking Dead and paste various IPs over the top. But the reason why The Walking Dead was such a hit wasn't just to do with the fact it was a recognisable property. The game innovated on the entire adventure game formula, with the whole team solely focused on making it the best they possibly could. When the company had several different titles in the pipeline at the same time, there was absolutely no way the same levels of creativity and care could be applied to each one. Telltale ended up saturating the market with mediocre games that all felt the same and lacked the spark and magic of their predecessors. And that's not even touching upon the missteps they made with other franchises that they did have the rights to. The Guardians of the Galaxy Telltale game was a much darker, grittier affair than the source material in subsequent films. And until late in development, Minecraft story mode had been targeted at teenagers, not the younger audience who were obsessed with the game. They'd been given the source material, provided proof of a dedicated audience, and a cheat sheet as to what the audience wanted to see. But apparently, Telltale knew better. The worst part was, these decisions weren't hurting those execs and investors. Forced to chase the ambitions of those in charge, the developers experienced some of the worst crunch the industry has ever seen. With so many games to make, and a relatively small team to make them, devs were relentlessly under the cost to deliver episodes. The company either didn't have the means, or the inclination, to hire more staff, or even pay the ones they did employ properly for their overtime, which could amount to 18-hour days and seven-day weeks. It got so bad that it was often left to junior developers straight out of university to help finish games, which invariably led to a decline in overall quality due to a lack of experience and expertise. And if that wasn't bad enough, the development cycle Telltale had introduced meant that, in theory at least, this could never end. Most game companies go through crunch cycles, where for most of the time they work regular hours, with a period of crunch for several months running up to a game's launch, as has been in cases like the Bioware Magic or Rockstar's development philosophy. While this isn't an acceptable situation by any means, it pales in comparison to what was happening at Telltale. Due to the episodic nature of their releases, there was always something to crunch over. A game's launch was essentially happening every few weeks, so the studio was always catching up with itself to get the next thing done. Workers would often burn out and leave, meaning staff rotation at Telltale was high, and that just cannot be sustained by anyone in the long run. With all this in mind, is it any wonder that things went downhill so fast for Telltale? And the people in charge could see it unfolding before their eyes. They were quickly running out of money as substandard games kept churning out to mediocre audience responses and poor sales figures. There was clearly panic in the boardroom as they announced that Telltale would be spreading itself even thinner by opening a publishing wing of the company in late 2015. By releasing other people's games using their expertise in self-publishing, they could make a quick buck to pour back into their own titles. Ultimately, however, they were just sticking a plaster on a gaping wound. They couldn't make enough money to satisfy investors, many of whom pulled out en masse. IP holders didn't see any benefit to working with Telltale, and offers stopped coming in. By October 2018, Telltale Games was closed for good. And then one day, it was back again. Barely a year later, in August 2019, a press release announced the return of Telltale Game Studios. They would be rehiring many key staff from the former studio and working on both new games and sequels to existing titles. But how had this suddenly happened? Well, all of Telltale's assets, including its IP and original name, were bought by LCG Entertainment under the leadership of industry veteran Jamie Otterley. He'd been a big fan of Telltale, and following its closure had made it his mission to get enough investment together to buy its key assets and bring back the games fans had been anticipating. Most notably, a sequel to The Wolf Among Us. As well as continuing Telltale's publishing arm, which had seen some success with titles like the Jackbox series of party games, Otterley also wanted Telltale to produce games based on a lesser-known IP, rather than leaning on massive franchises as they had done in the past. 
Its first major release will be The Expanse, a Telltale series. Based on the sci-fi TV series of the same name, it'll act as a prequel to the show. It's a bold move on their part, returning with a brand new IP that not many will be familiar with could result in a lack of interest. But on the other hand, as this is Telltale's first game back, there will perhaps be substantial curiosity from the gaming public as to what the studio's future might look like. But here's the thing. Is bringing back Telltale the right thing to do? Can they avoid making the same mistakes that shut down the company in the first place, hurting so many developers and costing a lot of people their jobs in the process? Well, the noises coming out of the company are good. When asked how things would be different, Ottilie brought up several key changes. They've switched to Unreal Engine to allow more creative freedom and quicker development time. They're employing a distributed development model, meaning more work is done using external resources. And they're making sure episodes are carefully planned out in advance, rather than rushing to create, develop and publish in a never-ending cycle. These suggest that Telltale's new executives are focused on eliminating the crunch working environment that infested the old regime, giving people more realistic expectations and working hours, which just sounds fantastic. However, Telltale's work culture was not the only reason it failed. The two games currently being developed are both external IPs that the developers are using as a starting point to jump off and create their own original stories. And both of these games will be following the same basic structure as everything they previously made. There'll be five episodes. You'll respond to prompts on the screen. Your choices will alter the narrative. Sure, they aren't making as many as they had been at their peak, so oversaturation might be avoided. But the reason The Walking Dead was such a success is because it was a departure for the adventure game genre as a whole. It'll take another drastic innovation like this to replicate that success again. And I'm just not sure the signs are indicating that'll happen. But I guess ultimately, we'll have to wait and see. Even this early on, it feels like a pivotal moment for Telltale Games. The Expanse and The Wolf Among Us 2 will have to prove that there's life in the old dog yet. And I for one live in hope that the team can once again reinvent the wheel.